Hello biochemists. I'm going to continue our discussion and I'm going to tell you about that new finding that I got together. Just want to put it into context of the nanowire bacteria that we started talking about. These are really weird but also really cool and look at the transformation of energy that is going on based on the chemical reactions. I want you to focus really on how oxidation happens away from oxygen and oxidation happens without oxygen. You're turning sulfide, H2S, into sulfate, SO4. Acetate into carbon dioxide. The carbon is bound to more oxygens. Therefore, you have oxidation going on. So, um, and what happens in the absence of oxygen, what oxidation means is removing electrons. See, the electrons are produced when you combine it with oxygen, oxygen and electrons are sort of opposite. You're adding oxygen, you're removing electrons. This has to do with oxygen's electronegativity, and it's really helpful for us on a reaction level. For the bacteria, it's helpful on a whole organism level. So the electrons come off of the oxidizing bacteria, and they end up going up the wire to the place where oxygen is. And then the electrons combine with oxygen, with just a little bit of acid, and that makes water. Water is a nice and stable molecule. It's one of the reasons why there's so much of it around the universe. And so you end up with this reaction that gives you a delta G that is negative and the organism can get energy from it. Notice also below that, there's another kind of reduction that will also give you energy, going from iron plus three to iron plus two. And maybe the organism doesn't do this to get energy, by the way. Maybe the organism does this because it needs iron plus two for something, or it needs to get rid of iron plus three. You see, there are lots of reasons for reactions other than just getting energy. But overall, when you take the cycle of reactions from the whole organism, they do have to add up so that the organism has to pay what it owes. It has to be able to have a negative delta G overall. The good news is the organism can spread things out and put them into the environment, increase the entropy of the environment while keeping its own entropy low, while making bonds that might be unstable, but if it can keep making those bonds, it can keep living. And that's all the organism cares about, okay? So, we had this question about what else can you eat. Notice the role of oxygen in everything, and notice that the opposite of oxidation is reduction. And when you don't have oxygen, because you don't have that abundant and very electronegative compound, you don't have as much electron motion in whatever sense, and you don't have as much energy. That's one of the reasons why oxygen is so special, and why I think that the only way you can get so much energy that you can have complex life is if you have oxygen going on. So when we talk about these other kinds of life, they are not humanoid, they're not even multicellular in many cases. In fact, I'd like to know about a multicellular one. There might be some that are like parasites. Anyways, don't get me going off on a, a, on a tangent. I might um, never come back. But here we have the, uh, the thing is when we go to other planets, we look for these chemical signatures. We calculate what the atmosphere should be for the planet just by itself. And that's an important baseline. Then we look at what the atmosphere actually has. And if something is different than what we expect, well, there's lots of explanations for it. It could be something inorganic that we didn't expect, or it could be something organic, which is not included in the calculations at all. Remember that the planet is at equilibrium. So we're looking for disequilibrium of some sort. There's an atmospheric equilibrium, and that's one of the drawbacks of some of the molecules that we mentioned. If we're looking for water, necessary for life, very important. It was made by that process that we saw, but it's also a stable molecule that will exist at equilibrium. Technically, life is always out of equilibrium. It's always spreading out the entropy of its surroundings while keeping its entropy low. That is, by definition, away from equilibrium. If life is at disequilibrium, and there's enough of it, then its environment may be at disequilibrium as well. That's what we're looking for when we're looking for life. So here's the Cassini, which went to Saturn, and they dropped the probe onto its Titan. 
which is a fascinating, it's one of the few places where you actually have surface weather, okay? It's far away from the sun, but it has liquid, solid, and gas on its surface in patterns of climate. Now, it's hydrocarbons. It's like methane and things like that. But still, it's, uh, it's something. You know, who knows if microbial life might be able to get out of it. It's probably so far from the sun that I can't see how microbial life would be able to ever get enough energy to evolve into something more. But it does have weathers, uh, it has liquid methane oceans, and it's under uh, benzene clouds and an ice surface. Ice is water, and so it has a lot of water. But all that water is solid at that temperature. So the Huygens uh, dove through the atmosphere. As it dove, it saw things like this as it went down. You can see what its cameras saw. If I told you that these images were false orange color of Earth, you would believe me. It looks like Earth geologically. Chemically, these are very different chemicals, but it's evidence that we really do have weather patterns going on. And so as it went through the atmosphere, it sampled the atmosphere, and it found everything that it was expecting from the equilibrium geological calculations, except it didn't find acetylene, didn't find hydrogen. So, hypothesis. Could there be liquid methane-based life that is eating the acetylene or hydrogen, getting electrons from it because life needs to move electrons around to form bonds? Maybe it's pulling electrons from these abundant and easy to oxidize things, but taking the electrons off means oxidizing them. But again, this is you should be acting like scientists here. As you're doing this science, you're developing your scientific mind, well, you're talking about the absence of evidence. Could one of these weather patterns be a complex chemical explanation that consumes the acetylene? And in fact, there was a recent paper that claims to have found a weather-based reason why the acetylene is not there. Which is sad, but I don't have to listen to them until they come out with another couple of papers. Something to keep an eye on, but this is the kind of thing that we end up doing as we go through the different, uh, the different possibilities. And this is what was released this morning. This is why I have to get this out today. You can't get any more current than this. Phosphine gas was detected in Venus's clouds. The thing about Venus is its surface is incredibly hot, probably blows apart every bond that you put down there. But if its surface is really hot and the top of its atmosphere is as cold as space, there's some place in the middle where you might have temperate temperatures where bonds, medium strength and low stability bonds can persist for long enough to life to build a replicating cycle out of these soft chemical bonds. So they were looking and they got a very weak signal. If you look at the paper, it's like it's one of those signals that you're like, I don't know if you're fooling yourself, but they looked many different ways. They think it's a real signal. They just detected at one wavelength, very sketchy evidence but good enough to pass peer review, and I'll take it for now as a possible sign that phosphine is there. Could there be a process that makes phosphine? You know, phosphine is not very stable. It's got a positive delta G of formation. Well, so does acetylene, by the way, but there's not as much phosphine that should be made. It should be hard to make, and there's not much phosphorus, and so the fact that they detected it at all was what they think of as you know, I'm not going to use red flag, um, I'm going to use green flag terminology, although because we're looking for life, so we're going to think of life as a living green color. Um, but the delta G of formation of phosphine might allow some of this to be done naturally if there's a process that we just don't know about because we don't know enough about Venusian cloud chemistry. Okay, but, you know, uh, it could happen, they say this in the paper, there could be some unknown photochemistry caused by light, geochemistry caused by rocks reacting, weather, or it could be produced by life. And there are phosphate reducing, they technically call it phosphor, phosphate solubilizing bacteria. There are bacteria that do this on earth. They, like we said, it's a way you can get energy and there's a lot of phosphate around and uh, you could do it for other reasons and energy as well. So all this is to say, 
this was when I saw this this morning I'm like okay put everything else off I'm going to have to tell my biochem students about this one there you go the other law of thermodynamics let's just we've been talking about it in metaphors let's talk about it exactly here it is in German if you want it but it's uh, the actual formulation of it, it uh, is that the entropy of the universe is continually increasing energy constant entropy increasing don't forget that phrase of the universe if the second law held everywhere we couldn't have anything living at all because the entropy of the universe would not allow life to form its entropy poor bubble but because it's the entropy of the universe life can reduce its own entropy and increase entropy of the surroundings that is one of the things that we can look for if it's doing this in the sense of phosphine making a small spread out molecule that um, that the the phosphorus has the phosphate has been turned into phosphine has been spread out through the atmosphere it could be an indication of a microbe on Venus spreading out the entropy of its surroundings so this is a uh, our best metaphor for entropy it's really math and so since uh, we don't speak math at that level in this class, which is fine with me, I'm going to use English. I'm going to say it's spreading out. So notice that entropy never decreases. This is a statement that if you look at non-living things, it makes a lot of sense. Molecular order never increases on its own accord. So if you take three examples, let's say you have a cloud of dust. It won't form spontaneously into the Statue of Liberty. Technically, that could happen, right? They could arrange themselves into the proper Statue of Liberty-like configuration, but they don't. The, the cloud will spread out; it won't coalesce, and it definitely won't coalesce into that one specific shape. Likewise, if you have a cylinder of gas, the gas will not collect spontaneously at one corner of that cylinder, which is really good for the room that you're in. You're glad that you don't have to worry. We have no, again, we have nothing to worry about, right? We don't have to worry about the gas suddenly collecting in one corner. Even though the gas technically could do that, what's preventing it from doing that? Not some chemical bonding type thing, but the fact that gases spread out to fill the container. So statistically speaking, one out of a trillion, trillion, trillion times, the gas might collect at one end, but uh, that's never going to happen if you calculate out what the st statistics are. So if you have a warm tabletop, the warmth is dispersed through the tabletop. It won't flood into a small region. It won't suddenly join a hot spot without having a reason for doing that. You don't leave an egg on a table and you'd be really surprised if that egg suddenly cooked. Now all the atomic motion could have suddenly gone into that egg, but that would be like the cloud of dust suddenly collecting in one place. So this applies to matter as well as ener heat energy that we talked about there. Another way of looking at it, and I said it's mathematical, so I wanted to come up with a mathematical metaphor for why entropy is what will happen most of the time. And it's saying that the universe on long time scales will do what happens most of the time. It will spread out. So if you have a reaction of rolling one die, all six sides have equal probabilities. All six sides have equal entropy. But if you roll two dice, you haven't changed anything about the configuration of the dice, but you've changed the reaction in the sense that you're doing it twice. And because each of the numbers combine in different ways, there are more ways to get a 7 by rolling two dice than there is to get a 2 or a 12. So we're talking about regular six-sided dice here, and rolling a 6 or an 8 is higher probability than 2 or 12. If you've played Settlers of Catan, you understand what I'm talking about when they say that the six play, a six tile is more valuable than a two tile because you're rolling two dice and more often you will get a six than you'll get a two. There's more ways to make a six than there is to make a two. The possibilities are more spread out. The possibility of getting a six in possibility space is more spread out than the possibility of getting a two. You see that we're into statistics land right now, and because that's not a prereq, I'm not going to say any more. But this is getting close to the mathematical definition of entropy. Can you think of another game that depends on seven being rolled more than when you're rolling two dice? Maybe Monopoly, I'm not sure. But um, 
it, if you have any game like that, it depends on the high entropy of rolling a seven. Okay, the universe spreads out in such a way that you get more sevens and you get twos. If you have an idea for another game-based explanation, I'm all ears. Send me an email. Let me know. So it's important to say the second law says the slope of the universe over time. S is the y-axis, time is the x-axis, and over time that line, S, is increasing. It doesn't say that it's maximal, and so it stands to reason, if you have a little corner of the universe, that it's not maximally spread out. If you spread it out more, then you're going along with what the universe likes to do. You're going along with the way the universe was built. And so what it says is that the universe that we live in is not maximally spread out. We can take a part of it, spread it out, and we can get energy of that because of the second law. We are making the universe more entropic. We're making it more spread out. That allows us to do work. Which, and work is very um, simple definition, a force applied over a distance. You're applying a force on something to move it over a certain distance. And that is literally mathematically what work is. So you can only do work, like deliberately move something in a deliberate direction, a deliberate distance, by increasing the, the entropy of the universe. When you move it in that direction, in a sense that's a low entropy movement, because you are moving it in this direction and not that one. So to make up for it, you spread out the rest of the universe in sort of a chaotic, disordered uh, direction. And one way you can think about this is you can think about the enthalpy of the reaction paired with the entropy. Technically, the enthalpy is the entropy in another way of talking, but um, I'll leave that for the PCHEM discussion. If you remember, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. The S is what we've talked about, entropy. T is temperature in Kelvin. G is free energy. H is enthalpy, which is the heat that the reaction gives out. And so you can, if you, you think about this other component that shows us that there are other things that can go on other than just spreading out in the universe. Entropy conversion can actually drive a reaction. The real good thing is when you get an entropy dri driven cycle of reactions, then the matter regenerates itself and the entropy makes it go, makes it turn. Light gets applies to the, the system, let's say that sunlight applies to a system on the earth and it gets released as heat. We talked about how that happens for every planet. The difference between the low entropy sunlight and the high entropy spread out emitted radiation, which is infrared, is the difference between those two numbers is the amount of work that the system can do. And if you have the work going in a circle, that means the force times distance is turning it in a circle and the entropy is actually driving the work. If you have a cycle, that means the cycle can continue as long as the low entropy light is shining on it. That is where I have this. This is my radiometer. And if I hold this up to a light, and I'm going to see if I hold it up to the um, screen, if there's enough white light. Probably not. It needs more intense light. The radiometer, if held in the light, it will actually turn. Can you see it turning there? And all the radiometer is, is it's a cycle that is driven by sunlight going onto it and heating up the black part as opposed to the white part. This, p these paddles have been disorganized, so they have a white side and a black side. The black side absorbs the heat, gets hotter in temperature, and makes the gas expand, and then the gas pushes. And you can see, actually if you see, it's turning in the particular direction the um, black paint side is pushing the white paint side. And there's a reason for that. That has to do with thermodynamics. So the thing is, as long as this is held up in the sunlight, the paddles will turn. Your chemical reactions in metabolism are cycles that do much the same thing. As long as they are held uh, up to the sun, 
as long as plants take sunlight and make bonds, we can break those bonds and make a cycle that makes more plants. That is capturing entropy and allowing the rest of the universe to spread out while here on Earth, life does its little bubbles of cells that stay organized. Not perfectly organized, but that's good too because you don't need to be perfectly organized to be alive. You just need to be a cycle of reactions that dissipates energy. If you have more sunlight, more entropy entering the system, more entropy captured by the system, the cycle will actually turn faster because it will make that much more entropy. This is how entropy can actually drive life. And so every organism, every collection of cells and every cell is fighting dissolution, is fighting the um, pull of the universe to spread out. And it pays by spreading out part of the universe so that it can stay together. There's a, we can calculate what the entropy cost is of maintaining the bonds in a living system. And you can estimate how much food does it need to eat and spread out in order to get the energy to keep these bonds together. And the bonds are what make up the organism. So every organism is organized. Remember that the disordered state is more likely, it's more stable, therefore lower in energy. But if you have a, if you have a gas that is spread out, the disordered state for that is more is more likely. So bacteria that cause decay are using this chemistry to be able to spread out matter and energy. They break down big molecules into small ones and they give off heat and they give out small molecules. The bacteria themselves are able to maintain a couple of bonds to keep themselves together and but that's how they get their energy. When a plant captures light energy, changes it to heat, it increases entropy because the light has been changed to heat. That energy difference is what it can capture and it can make bonds out of that. The more difficult the bond is to make, the more light you need to make it. So, I always, you know, in a sense we are jumping in at the deep end and that's the way it is for this whole class. But these are also concepts that you can go in and think about. I want you to think about these and on the test, I'm going to ask you questions to say, hey, have you thought about it in this way? And they're going to be based on what I said and based on what the Leninger sections are. So if this blows your mind a little, that's good. It blows mine too. But, and it blows my mind that we can find phosphine on Venus and what that might mean. Also, it blows my mind kind of how faint the signal was. So um, realize that we talked about these. Please do send me an email. I've gotten most of them already and um, get started on the things. If it seems like a lot right now, it is a lot, but you do have a matter of weeks to get this stuff done. I'm just giving you it, it to you all right now so that you know as soon as possible what you need to do, and you can start organizing your own life while you are thinking about the, um, the food that you need to eat to spread out to get the energy for that, and the social time where you need to give yourself a Sabbath and let yourself spread out mentally and socially as well. Okay, so uh, there you go. There's your whole metaphor for the week. But I will see you on Wednesday or in lab.